joining us this evening for our narrative seminar featuring Dr. Leah Orr of the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. For those of you who haven't attended one of our events previously, although I see many familiar faces, the Narrative mm -hmm. Seminar hosts speakers from across literature studies, creative writing and history from across the globe with the aim of exploring the ways in which narratives about disciplines and within disciplines um, conceived as broadly as possible really work to shape our understandings of the past and present. Sometimes this involves creative writing readings, so people read out poems or uh, prose fiction. Um, other times it'll be a uh, roundtable dialogue. Um, and on other occasions, as tonight, we host academic papers. The series is led by a group of us, University of Greenwich academics, working in the fields just mentioned, namely Dr. Emily Critchley, um, who unfortunately can't be here tonight, um, Dr. Justine Bailey, Professor Maria Artke and myself, and it sits within the Centre for Research in Literature and Heritage in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences. So, so much for, for organisational structures. Tonight is really exciting because it marks the start of our fourth year of Narratives Seminar Programming, and I'm really delighted to introduce Dr Orr's suitably metadisciplinary paper entitled Literary History as Publishing History. Rethinking Chronology in the Canon. Leah is Associate Professor of English at the University of Louisiana Lafayette, as I said, where she currently holds the Joseph P. Montiel Board of Regents Professorship. She has held visiting fellowship at institutions in the UK and elsewhere, and is the author of many articles on 18th century literature, as well as the book Novel Ventures, Fiction and Print Culture in England, 1619-1730 published in 2017. I'm also thrilled to announce that her most recent book, Publishing the Woman Writer in England, 1670 to 1750, was published by Oxford University Press in 2023. I've had an opportunity to take a look at it um, and it's really worth reading if that's your field of interest. Leah's going to be speaking for approximately 45 minutes, after which we'll open the floor to questions. Um, you can put your questions in the chat now, uh, thank goodness, or uh, you can choose to communicate them over the microphone later on. Um, just so you know, Leah's talk will be recorded on Zoom, so please do switch off your cameras if you prefer not to be captured for posterity. Finally, before handing over to Leah, I'd like to thank the University of Greenwich and Krell's director, Maria Arce, for supporting our seminar series, as well as um, offering a big thank you again to Leah for joining us this evening. Over to you. All right, thank you so much. And I would just like to thank uh, the University of Greenwich and Katerina for inviting me and for providing this forum. Um, it is a delight to see you all. And thank you also for accommodating the Zoom uh, presentation since I wasn't able to be in the UK for this. Um, so I'm going to share my screen where I have a PowerPoint. Um, one moment. Okay. Um, I will make it full screen. Okay, is that working properly, Katerina? It looks great, Leah, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. So today I'll be talking about literary history as publishing history. Um, and essentially what I'm trying to do here is to, to present the history of literary history, a sort of meta-historical dialogue um, in order to show that, that literary history as we practice it now is a history of publishing. And if we if we think of it that way, we can better understand what we're trying to do with literary history, and perhaps also think more broadly about some alternative ways that we might approach it. So um, my first section will be about literary history and how it's currently practiced and what we do with it. Um, then I'll explore some of the origins of literary history. Um, I will look at how publishers have historically shaped this canon. And then I'll present some alternative methods for approaching literary history, ways that we might think about this a little bit differently. All right. So what is literary history? Um, literary history is, um, it is often chronological. 
It, narrative history is less common now in scholarship, but chronology is still an organizing element in scholarly fields and scholarly books. Um, as you can see, um, this is the Norton Anthology of English Literature, volume B, the 10th edition. Um, this is a commonly taught uh, textbook in, in the United States, at least. I don't know if it's commonly used in the UK. But as you can see, it begins with the 16th century and it organizes its text by author and chronology. And this is a very common way of thinking about literary history, the sort of progress through the past. And although our scholarship in literary history is less teleological than it used to be, scholars still often use development as their primary historical lens. We often are trying to find the origins of literary history to try to find where we started and how we got to where we are. While earlier literary historians were often trying to find how we got to some more positive point in the present, I think that now scholarship has been more open to the fact that perhaps uh, there is less of a value judgment there. So anthologies such as this one are often organized around a specific time and place. This one in particular is um, organized around England, and this is the 16th century volume, but there are other volumes in the series. And they're often in chronological order. So in this case, you can see the dates are prominent. There's a timeline in the introduction. This makes sense. It's very logical. Um, it feels very familiar because many of us ourselves learned history in this chronological progressive sort of way. But it can sometimes run into problems. This is the um, table of contents for the Norton Anthology of American Literature. And as you can see, it begins with Native American oral literature fought directly after the timeline. And the whole volume is constructed around this idea of pro progress. It begins with beginnings to 1820. Um, the, the chronology is the, the guiding principle. However, many of these Native American cultures did not look at time in the same way. They don't think of time as a progress, a progress from one point to the next. They don't think of themselves as being origins or pre-Columbian. And so by imposing these kinds of chronologies onto literature, we sort of force that literature into a sequence that it may not necessarily have. So there are some teaching applications here, obviously. Um, these are textbooks, primarily, not scholarly works, but they derive from scholarship and from the scholarship that we've been thinking of um, that went into making them. They are written by scholars, and we use these in our organizing of our degree plans and specific courses or modules of study. Um, I looked at, at your university to make sure that I wasn't... Um, you know, making an assumption about something. And I, I did see that you also have, similar to my university, a course about the literary canon that students in the English program take in their first or second year. And so this is a very common way of thinking, you know, that we we want our students to have the, the basis of literary history so that then we can perhaps um, trouble or critique that basis later on in their studies. But But we start with this sort of chronology um, that we expect students to know. Within the class term itself, books are often presented chronology, chronologically. I do this when I teach as well, and it makes it very logical. It, it conveys an implicit argument of, of progress and cause and effect. And it can help students put things into an order. They understand certain works were happening at the same time as other works. So there's a sort of implicit narrative that happens in the way that we think about English literature in the past. And not just English, this is true in other fields as well. Um, though my primary touchstones here will be from English literature. So there's an implied narrative and an implied argument that that narrative is important and that that is the most important thing that we think that literary history does is that it provides a narrative of how we got from the past to the present in some kind of progressive way. It may not necessarily be a positive pro progression, but it is still a progression nonetheless. So what are the origins of this? Um, it's so ingrained that I hadn't really thought to ask about the origins of literary history until fairly recently, when I was wondering, why is it that I teach in the way that I do? And so I started looking into the origins of literary history in the 18th century. And here, 
I found that there are a lot of early narrative histories. Um, the early narrative histories are often pulling together um, history from different time periods in order to to provide some kind of some kind of example of what his, what literature is. How did we get to the 18th century, which you know, for 18th century writers, they often believed was the height of all um, previous work. So we see that that earlier early writers are starting to pull together literary history in order to figure out where they came from. In some of these early examples, however, it's not necessarily what we would expect. Um, these are two examples of early collections of fiction and they are not presented chronologically and they are also not English. So these are late 17th century and 18th century collections, um, a collection of novels in four volumes. And you can see many of which never appeared in English before, all new translated from the originals. So these earlier collections of fiction are not necessarily presenting a chronological uh, progression through the past, but they are collecting the past in order to bring it into the present. Over time, however, we start getting more examples that are um, presenting a sort of chronological history to this past. Um, you might be familiar, for example, with John Samuel Johnson's Lives of the Poets. Um, this is another type of anthology series called Bell's British Poets. And this particular example is um, Bell's edition of the Great Poets of Great Britain, complete from Chaucer to Churchill. Um, that is, you know, you can see how Bell is presenting a chronology from Geoffrey Chaucer to Churchill in the 18th century, more or less a contemporary poet. And the each of the poets are featured with a life of the author, if possible, um, and other par par paratexts that um, sort of uh, establish the author and the work in the importance of literary history. So in this case, you can see the example of Milton, the poetical works of John Milton from the text of Dr. Newton in four volumes contains the life of the author and a critique on Paradise Lost. Each volume also contained a frontispiece. And as you can see in this example, it's from Paradise Lost. Um, it is depicting Eve in the Garden of Eden at the moment she eats the fruit from book nine of Paradise Lost. So this is a way of packaging earlier English literature for a later audience. And it's a way of doing it in a chronology and presenting it as important. It's important because it is past, but it's bringing it into the present. So the the new frontispiece, the new pack, the new um, life of the author, the new packaging of this makes it current for the contemporary moment, but is still trying to present this past work as important because of its situation in the past. Um, so the other thing I would point out, out about these early 18th century efforts to organize literature is that they're very nationalistic. <laughs> In this case, it is not simply the Bell's edition of poets, it is the poets of Great Britain. And it is presenting itself as complete, that you don't need any other books of poetry, you don't need any um, additional ways of seeking out poetry, you buy this series and you have, you have attained English poetry um, in all of its all of its heightened, heightened vigor. Um, so you can see here how there is a publishing impulse behind this. I will come back to this idea. But a lot of these collections of earlier English writing or histories of early English writing are centered around the desire to bring that writing back into a public sphere in the present moment. So not just to let it rest in, on library shelves in its early editions, but to reprint it and create a need for that, that current audience. There's, there is a sense of making literature and history a bit more scientific in this time period as well, um, though that happens much more in the, 18th, in the 19th century as they begin um, looking at literature from a more taxonomic standpoint. So the other reason that we start seeing a lot of literary history in the 18th century is that it, it, it's meant to aid those who collect books. Book collecting becomes a much bigger enterprise in the 18th century than it had been earlier for a variety of reasons. One is that it there are a lot of people who have money to collect books. 
And a second is that there are more books available to collect. Um, collecting books becomes accessible for the middle class and not just for the elites. So you see more interest in building a library. You see um, dedicated library rooms and library architecture. And part of this is that the people who are collecting books needed to know what they should be buying. Um, not everyone is an expert on books. And this was not a time when you might just um, at, you know, go into a, a library and find everything you might need in one spot. So you start seeing an antiquarian interest in the early English past and items like this. Um, this is an 18th century um, book that is about the early printer, William Caxton, who's probably familiar to those of you who study medieval and Renaissance literature. And here you can see there's a, this, this book is, has a, a new um, engraving of Caxton and it is trying to present him as an important historical person in his contributions to literary history, the first printer in England, in which is given an account of the rise and progress of the art of printing in England during his time till 1493. So this is printed in the 18th century, and it is, it is seeking to meet a need for histories of the early English print that can help sort through this massive material that has survived in various forms that people are trying to figure out what is what to do with. They're trying to figure out how to collect it, how to buy it, how to value it, how to preserve it, and what to do with it. So you start getting um, you start getting dedicated library rooms in spaces such as this one. This is Belton House um, in Lincolnshire. There are great library collections and collectors needed these catalogs and guides to the books that they acquired and sought to acquire. And they also needed to know what was published when and how it related to other books. As you can see, a library like this also would start to need a catalog of its own. And so you see book collectors not only looking for catalogs and lists and literary histories to help them tell them what to buy, but then they start writing catalogs and lists and literary histories based on their own collections and the things that they have learned from these collections. So this is a book receipt for the Earl of Sunderland from the bookseller Paul Vaillant from 1709. And this shows exactly what this sort of process looked like. Um, as you can see, it's a long list of mostly pretty valuable books. Um, and it, it shows that he's buying these books that come from all different time periods from different languages and from different places. Um, Paul Vaillant was one of many booksellers that the Earl of Sunderland worked with. And he, act, he acted as, Paul Vaillant acted as an agent for Sunderland and other great collectors. So he sought out books across Europe in order to help uh, fill in gaps in the collection. But in order to fill in gaps, you have to know what existed. And that's where a lot of the literary histories and catalogs come in. So here, you can see one of the early attempts at a general catalog of books and all languages, arts, and sciences that have been printed in Great Britain and published since the year 1700 to the present time. So this was the kind of resource that you begin to see in, in the 18th century. Now, this, this is not literary history. This is a, a book catalog. It is not trying to discriminate between good books or bad ones or ones that are important and should be read and reprinted and ones that are better forgotten in the past. It's simply trying to present what is there so that a collector might know how to find it and what, it, what, what books are out there that they still need to collect if they're trying to get that complete kind of collection. So publishers then, publishers are responsible for many of these earlier efforts to reprint and organize literature. Um, many publishers are using early li or use literary history to try to sell more books and to generate interest in the older works that had fallen out of popular favor. For example, in the late 18th century, we see a we see reprints of earlier fictions, including works like Robinson Crusoe and Moll Flanders, that are both reprinted in their entirety and also abridged. Works like Roxana are even rewritten in order to have a more satisfying ending without any uh, real indication that that's the case. So 
publishers basically pull things from the back catalog and reprint them. And literary history provides an audience for people to read these earlier works. We see examples in the 19th century then of large uh, series of books attempting to reprint the most important and to generate that kind of interest. So this is an example of um, Sir Thomas More's Utopia that was part of an English reprint series edited by Edward Arbor. It eventually reached 150 volumes, um, ironically beginning with Milton's Areopagitica, which is about the printing practices itself. Um, and this is the sort of series that publishers love because it had almost endless possibility. And it provided a reason for people to read and to buy books that otherwise they might not have much interest in. Um, Utopia is not necessarily a best-selling type of narrative. And in the 19th century, um, there may not have been as much interest in this, but publishing it in a large collection with um, many other items that are of more familiarity means that that readers who had bought other books in the series might come and buy this one. So there was a lot of interest in the 19th century for this sort of thing. Here's another example of this kind of reprint series. The British novelists, an essay with an essay prefaces and biographical and critical by Mrs. Barbald. That's Anna Letitia Barbald. Um, this is a series of British uh, fiction that was published in the early 19th century. As you can see, there's a large number of publishers involved in the production of this. Um, the, this is the example of the history of the adventures of Joseph Andrews, which is one of the volumes. Um, it eventually reached 49 volumes and each volume had a new preface, a new biography um, of the author and uh, critical remarks applying the work to the 19th century and explaining how it is important for 19th century readers. So sort of taking the earlier works out of their past environment and making them seem more current and contemporary. Whoops. Um, sorry about that. Um, so making them seem more current and contemporary. This is an example of what happens then in the 20th century. And this is where we start to see that intersection with teaching. Um, this is an anthology that was published in 1933 and it was still in use in the 1970s um, because this is the one that my mother used in college. So um, it was used as a teaching text and it is an anthology of English drama. And as you can see, it has um, in the table of contents, this is the list of illustrations, each play is accompanied with a facsimile reprint of its title page of the first edition. So here's where you can see that um, combination of literary history and cataloging and anthologies and teaching. Um, the English drama is being presented again in a nationalistic way. This is only English drama. It is presented chronologically. And um, the emphasis is on the publication date of the first edition, that the, the moment of its first appearance is the guiding principle of organization here. All right. Um, so what are some alternative methods if we're not going to do chronological history, if we're not going to do history that progresses from a point in the past towards the present um, with a sort of cause and effect applied narrative. What, what do we do instead? Well, there are some ways that we can think about this differently. First, I'd like to us to think a bit about the experiences of writers. Many of us are writers ourselves and we study writers. And so we know that writers are often influenced by many works from various times and places not just the works that have been published that same year as the work that they are writing. We've done this well, that is scholars, have done this well in looking at 20th century and contemporary writers. Um, so you think of somebody like T.S. Eliot, um, who wrote about the anxiety of influence and, and so forth. Um, it, you know, scholars of Eliot have looked extensively at his reading and his influences and have remarked on the wide range of influences that he had. 
we've also done this in a very well in a very broad sense. Um, so, for example, scholars of the Renaissance um, speak, you know, routinely about the influence of classical texts uh, on the writers in the in the 17th, in the 16th and 15th centuries. But we tend not to think about writers from the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries encountering works from the recent-ish past. That is, those works they would have encountered as reprints, gifts, or secondhand copies, as though they are new works. The other thing that we should think about with writers is that they often spend a long time writing their works. Um, so their view of what a work's historical moment might be is different from when it is actually published. So think, for example, of something like Northanger Abbey. I struggle to know when I teach that book where I should place it in my chronology because we know it was composed in the 1790s, but it was not published until 20 years later. And so did we put it as an 18th century text and teach it alongside other works of 1790s fiction, even though no one but Austin and her family read it in that time? Or do we put it as a 19th century text and teach it alongside works of early 19th century fiction, even though it doesn't seem quite to be responding to those texts because it was written earlier? Another example would be something like Finnegan's Wake that took 17 years for the writer to compose. Um, now, that's obviously a work that draws extensively on other literatures and, and folklore and so forth. But you know, when we look at the publication date, it gives us a false sense of its moment of creation. So thinking about the experiences of writers, we can teach texts as taking a long time and not just being a, a text that appeared in a single moment, but to think of it as a text that emerges through a period of time. If we think about the experiences of readers, we can also um, get a wider sense of what that time might look like. So I want to give you one example of a reader that you might be familiar with. Um, this is from Jane Eyre. So in Jane Eyre, um, the narrator writes, Bessie asked if I would have a book. The word book act acted as a transient stimulus and I begged her to fetch Gulliver's Travels from the library. This book I had again and again perused with delight. I considered it a narrative of facts and discovered it in a, in a vein of interest deeper than what I found in fairy tales. Yet when this cherished volume was now placed in my hand, when I turned over its leaves and sought in its marvelous pictures, the charm I had till now never failed to find, all was eerie and dreary. The giants were gaunt goblins, the pygmies malevolent and fearful imps, Gulliver a most desolate wanderer in most dread and dangerous regions. I closed the book, which I dared no longer peruse, and put it on the table beside the untasted tart. Now, this is a depiction of a fictional character, but I think it tells us a lot about reading. In this section, Jane is still a child and she is reading a book that was published over a hundred years earlier and housed in the library. We don't know anything about when this particular edition of Gulliver's Travels was published, but she's reading it in a contemporary moment that happens much later. And the way that she's reading it is influenced by that later um, thinking. So Gulliver's Travels is a book that over time becomes more of a children's book and less of an adult book. And so we see that 19th century view of Gulliver's Travels as a children's book in the way that it's described here. She's not reading it as political satire the way that a reader in 1726 might have done. I would also like to highlight that the, this book is important in part because of its physical nature. It is a cherished volume, not any, any particular, not any edition of Gulliver's Travels, but this particular copy is what is important. And yet at the same time, the reader has different views of this book when she's reading it at this moment than when she's read it at past moments. These are all things that readers are very familiar with in our own practices, but we don't normally think of this as being part of literary history. We would put Gulliver's Travels in the literary history of 1726, and that's where it stays. But here we can see a Victorian reader enjoying Gulliver's Travels and yet having a variety of experiences of it in her contemporary moments. So 
readers, as you can see, can be highly peripatetic in their reading choices. Even those who mainly read new books are not reading everything. And it's not clear from a contemporary perspective what will emerge as important later. So if you read diaries or other areas where people discuss their reading, you will find that readers read very random things. Um, and this is true, of course, you know, we can all probably think of our own reading in some random ways. Even someone who is attempting a, a particular course of study or who tends to favor certain genres or types of work will still find that they go back and forth between different types of things and that they might pick up some things randomly. You know, a book that is a gift from a friend or loaned for them or recommended by, you know, a class or, or somebody that they speak with. And even readers who really are trying to read new books are not going to read every new book. And so again, their context for reference is going to be skewed depending on what books they're actually reading and looking at. Someone whose books are mainly things that they've read in the London Review of Books is going to have a different view than somebody who is getting most of their recommendations from Goodreads. Readers' choices are often shaped by the access to books, the cost, leisure time, and many other elements that are not about the book's content or literary value at all. So we see often when we, re when we look at examples from the past of readers um, talking about what they read, that early readers read books because they happen to come to hand. You know, they, um, they're given a book and so they read it. Or they're, they have, you know, in this case, the book happens to be in the library that Jane Eyre has access to. Um, maybe she would have liked Robinson Crusoe better. Maybe she would have enjoyed uh, Arabian Nights, or she talks about Arabian Nights, but maybe she would have enjoyed something else that, that the library just doesn't have, and she doesn't know it exists. She's not reading Joseph Andrews. We don't know if that's because she prefers Gulliver's Travels, or if it's because she doesn't have access to, go to Joseph Andrews. Um, Studying past readers is also sometimes happen, hampered by the fact that those who are best documented are very unusual. So this is one of the problems if you've ever looked at the reading experience database, um, which I highly recommend if you haven't already checked it out. Um, most of what is documented on there are the experiences of readers who are also themselves writers. And that makes sense because the documentation that survives is from people who wrote down what they thought about their books and what they happened to be reading. And the majority of readers don't really do that if they're just reading for fun. So we end up getting, again, a sort of skewed view of what reading was like in the past because we're looking mainly at what writers and deep thinkers are looking at, not what everybody is, is reading. When we study readers in the aggregate, we can yield examples of what books sold widely. So for example, if you're looking at um, what books were reprinted frequently or how, what books had large editions that they sold, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're worth studying for literary value. And here's where we get into the conflict between literary history and social history. Um, social history would be very interested in the books that were most popular. Um, for example, school books and almanacs but we don't necessarily want to teach school books and almanacs or read them and study them now. We want to look at other types of literature. So these are sort of two different enterprises, but they can work together. Readers are all very individualized, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be thinking about them. We can study some individual readers and think more about why and how they read what they did. We can also think about literature as documentary evidence. What I mean by that is that literature is a material context. It's influenced by and then influences other things in its moment of creation and all that comes after it. So to take my example of Northanger Abbey, Northanger Abbey did not influence any other books in the 1790s or first decade of the, of the 19th century, as far as we know, because nobody knew about it. Nobody knew about it until it was published. So if what we're trying to do is figure out the influence of Northanger Abbey on other texts, then we have to take the moment of its publication as the starting point for that. But if we're trying to figure out what texts may have informed Northanger Abbey, then we can look at works 
from earlier time that before it was published that might have been more contemporaneous to its actual composition. Our study of early works is shaped in part by collection practices that have led some works to be preserved and others less so. So scholars who have been looking at the history of libraries have documented this very thoroughly, that collection practices have tended to favor certain types of books. And I'll come back to what this looks like in a moment. Um, but in some ways, we have favored literature over other types of writing because literature is often collected and saved and other types of writing, almanacs and school books, for example, may not be. Um, other scholars have documented that uh, writers who are publishing with major publishing houses, whose books are in large format editions, and who often tended to be people at the center of the um, circles of privilege that that make up our world, um, they tended to be more collected and more saved. Whereas writers who are writing at the fringes, for example, writers from religious minorities or writers who are um, from racial, gender, and ethnic minorities, writers who are working class, they might not have access to the same kinds of publishing opportunities and their works, if they are published, may end up in formats that don't get saved as easily. Certain types of works therefore have been more likely to be preserved than others. And so we have taken these as the central canon of literary history. Decisions by publishers to reprint certain books and not others makes them influential for multiple moments in the past. So my earlier example of Thomas More's Utopia would invite a scholar of the Victorian period to figure out why that was chosen for the English reprint series and not other works and what what that work might have said to the Victorian era that it didn't say to earlier eras. And then finally, we should also think about used books. So used books are a bit difficult to study, and this is where my current research has led me. Um, even if we look at reprints of earlier fiction as a way to chart influence, we've often not really looked very hard at the influence of used books. But as readers and writers ourselves, I think we can agree that many of us read used books and we read books that we encounter that were published long ago um, and that that encountering of used books can be very random. So when we're looking at used books in the past and trying to figure out their influence, we should remember that collectible books may not actually be used. Um, so I have here an image of a 1470 edition of, um, of Virgil, and this was owned by the Earl of Sunderland, who I mentioned earlier as an important book collector. And um, it's now in the Princeton University Library. And as you can see, it is extremely clean. It is in very good shape. It does not look like somebody has read it. Um, and if they have read it, they've taken very good care of it. This is the kind of book that we often see in rare books libraries, and it has been preserved because it was in a library and it has been saved through the centuries. But that doesn't mean that it was read. It doesn't mean that it was widely influential in its current form. And so when we look at used books, we are sort of caught because er the earlier you go, the more likely it is that the books that survived are precisely those that were not used, that were that were preserved and and therefore cannot tell us much about how they were used or who used them. I'd like to give you another example of how to study used books. Um, this is a oh, sorry, a rather blurry photo of books that were for rent. Um, this is an account from 1691 that survives of the Lady Wong and Sir James Long. Um, and it's an account with a bookseller. And we have here a list of books that they bought and dates in which they bought them. It's a running account on credit. Um, but they also have some books that they paid just six pence for that are listed here as for reading. And what that means is that they were renting or borrowing the books, not with the intent to return them, but with the intent to read them, or sorry, with the intent to return them, not with the intent to keep them. So this can also give us some clues into reading because of course, as I think we can agree, we often will buy books and not actually read them. And everybody does this. Um, the 18th century and earlier time periods were no different than today. 
And so looking at what books a person owns or what books a person acquires doesn't necessarily tell you what they read. But here, when you have people who are renting books, you can know with a certain, um, not certainty, but with more assurance that they at least intended to read them because the person wouldn't pay to rent a book if they didn't mean to look at it. So we can look at lists of libraries um, in the later 18th century and the 19th century, there are lending libraries and circulating libraries where you can see who borrowed what. And that can give you also some sense of reading. Though, of course, it, you know many people undoubtedly bar borrowed books with the intention of reading them and never did. And looking at a list of what somebody borrowed doesn't necessarily tell us what they thought about each of these books. So this is finally a picture of a place that I'm sure is familiar to some of you, the British Library. Um, and I wanted to conclude with this because used books, so used books remain in circulation for a long time. And on some level, the books in this library and other rare books libraries are in circulation to this day. I mean, they don't leave the library, but they are still used and read and studied and scanned and made online. And they're still sort of existing and circulating in that sense. And so they influence later readers and writers in unexpected ways. Um, but they are also artifacts in the past. And so they may have the markings of their past readers. They may have other signs that influence our interpretation or understanding of them. And so what I wanna conclude with is this idea that the literary past is experienced in the contemporary moment. Um, the history and the readings for reasons for teaching it are never totally neutral. Um, and that we have the, we have some options if we want to get away from the chronological history. Um, we can think more about what this contemporary existence of books in our current world means. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leah. That was wonderful. Um, I think you're back on camera now. Wonderful. And I'm just, excuse me while I, <clears throat> everyone, while I rearrange my um, chat bar so that it's not blocking people's screens. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Leah. It was, it was really wonderful as someone who's in the middle of a teaching term to have this kind of moment to, to uh, pause and reflect on what it is we are teaching when we teach uh, as, as I think most of my, most of my colleagues and myself do it in any case uh, through the lens of historical periodization and uh, your your discussion of chronology I think will be familiar to, to most people who have studied literature at or history even at university. Um, although I was thinking actually in school we had a totally ahistoricized encounter with literature which just involved uh, these kind of random anthologies with a uh, potpourri of uh, uh, different texts that we uh, were not invited to scrutinize in historical context. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. I'm I'm sure there will be uh, questions uh, coming at you very shortly, but I thought maybe I could kick off with one of my own. Um, I, I love that you started with the 18th centuryist as an 18th century, I think, yeah, historical, well, history, modern history and, and literary history as well do begin in that period, um, I'm sure. Um, Others working later or earlier might disagree, but um, I kind of was thinking about the reference you made very briefly to the fact that in this period you get uh, a tendency to uh, narrate history teleologically with this idea that you start with barbarism and confusion and ignorance, <laughs> and then you know uh, you get a, a kind of gradual improvement and enlightenment that results in the sort of illumination of the present day, whatever that is, whether it's 1720 or 1780 or, you know, 1810. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned how, how the extent to which this mode of doing history uh, has declined, I guess, I guess, rightfully, we're, we're much more suspicious of progress narratives these days. Um, but I just, I wondered whether you think that maybe this decline in teleological literary history and especially in those kind of those volumes of those, those kind of literary history monographs that used to get published quite recently which would not you know 
introduced their rationale as, as being to do with making a specific argument, but whose rationale was literally to tell you about this one topic. Um, that's not really very popular with academic publishers anymore. Um, I think, you know, outside of, you know, quite strictly defined series where you have, you know, the Cambridge history of publishing or something like that, it's not generally the done thing anymore. And even in those works that are presented as historical survey works, um, the understanding is that chapters and authors contributing to those big volumes usually will offer actual arguments about what's going on. Yeah, as opposed to just telling you a series of things. Yeah. Um, so I just wondered whether that decline might contribute to the fact that we're now kind of thinking of literary history as quite dispersed. I mean, that's how it felt in your talk, that literary, literary history doesn't have a place where it's kind of told in a in a sort of authoritative narrative. It's kind of, you know, gleaned and, and communicated and developed through anthologies, through course syllabuses, through, you know, records of reader practices, through, um, you know, publishing lists, that there, we are now perhaps more open to, mm -hmm. to that idea of a dispersed history now that we don't expect literary historians like ourselves to mainly be interested in, in, in telling a definitive story. Um, is, is that oversimplifying things or do you feel that 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 kind of is is maybe one of the things that has shifted in the last say 80 years or even more recently. I do think that's true. Um, yes, I would agree with that. I think that narrative history at the academic level has sort of, um, as you said, fallen out of favor. Um, I mean, we still see it, you know, there is the Oxford history of English literature that is slowly being published. Um, and so they are that there is still a place for some of that, but I think that it's not where new scholarship is really happening. It's the place where it is being summarized for people who want that kind of a literary history. But where we do see literary history still enacting is the sort of um, implicit ways. So for example, um, when you look at many monographs in English literature, they're organized chronologically. And there's a sort of implication that that is the default, um, that if you're going to write, you know, if you're going to write a book about the 20th century novel and you have five novels that you put them in chronological order, um, even if the argument isn't necessarily about progress or development, there's a sort of implied argument behind that chronology that I think we haven't quite interrogated as much as we should. Um, and it's sort of, it's often taken as a sort of neutral point. And I guess what I would like to, to encourage us to think about today is that it's it's not neutral. It is a, a choice, just like any other choice would be to about how we organize our, our thinking. Um, so yes, yeah. but I would agree with you that this sort of old school, you know, let me tell you the history of English literature kind of book is no longer something that we see as much of. Yeah, I'll, thank you for that, uh, for that. That Yeah, that, that really speaks to my own experience. I teach a prose fiction course and I'm I'm always debating with myself whether it would make sense to have kind of topic clusters as opposed to trying to work my way from the late 1700s towards the present yeah it's it's kind of I think it takes a kind of leap of faith as educators or even as readers to detach oneself from those structures because they seem so deeply embedded in in the reading practice whether we're academics or not and we have some questions being uh, or at least one question being articulated here um Athena uh, Picheru um writes um thank you for the presentation I would like to ask about the role of technologies such as printing technologies which allowed mass production and archival technologies in relation to literary history so um mm -hmm. yeah yes um, thank you for that. I think that they have been really important in our in changing our understanding of literary history over time. So in the 19th century, I think that cheap reproductions um, using electroplate prints, presses and wood pulp paper um, were one of the reasons that we see reprints of earlier English fiction, because all of a sudden there, there was such a need for, for publishing that it exceeded the, the new material being submitted. And so um, there's a real uh, a real gap being filled um, in the publishing industry, and and the technology is part of that. 
And I think now we have technology that is enabling us to access these works from the past in a contemporary way, in a much more accessible way. So you no longer have to go to a rare books library to look at pictures of rare books and you uh, you can experience books, um, at, you know, the image of a book at least um, in the way that it was experienced by its early readers. And so now when I teach upper level classes, I often assign my students um, the copy of the book from Google Books or um, Early English Books Online or whatever the relevant source is, in addition to their student paperback that they're reading, because I think that it's important for them to understand that their student paperback edition is not the way other, is not the way that the book was experienced and that that is itself a creation of a modern world um, that is, you know, influenced by capitalism and the education industrial complex and everything else that goes into, um, you know, the Oxford world's classics or whatever it is that they're looking at. So, um, but I think the technology, it has enabled me to think about this in a way that I wouldn't have if the, you know, the internet and its resources didn't exist. Um, you know, that the, the way these books can exist contemporaneously with each other and be compared and looked at and searched, um, is very different than what we might have experienced even just 20 years ago. Thank you for that, Leo. Yeah, I was thinking also as you were speaking there of, you know, this phenomenon on TikTok of like really forgotten tracks from like 15 years ago suddenly becoming huge hits with Generation Z because because someone's done some really cool dances to them and, and that, you know, all those ideas about how you know, work of art appears, is recognized or not recognized, celebrated or not, and then either survives the classic or doesn't. That kind of linear kind of decline has been completely disrupted by technology. Um, yeah. Um, we've got another question. Um, Andrew King says, uh, a welcome reminder of the role of reprints and reprinting and the sheer messiness of chronology, despite the Whiggish versions of progressivist history. I was struck, though, by the absence uh, of the transpersonal as a literary regulator from your narrative, um, as in the state, the law, customary practices, and so on. These regulate the writing, the tech, and the dissemination through laws. I'm wondering if this is because your focus was on the individual and influencers. I'd love to hear more about how you see the relationship between the individual and the transpersonal. Oh, certainly. Um, so, one of the things I've been looking at in some of my recent work is about copyright and how that influences um, the works that get studied and reprinted and the ones that don't. And in the 18th century, this is a bit of a messy, a messy business because copyright um, didn't quite exist in the way that we currently think of it. And there wasn't an international copyright, but all of that becomes important in looking at who is reprinting what. And so when we start seeing in the 1770s and 80s, these reprints of early English works in part it's because um, it, there there's a sense of there's a new established newly established sense of what the public domain is and um, so we do definitely see that influence I think in literary history and um, in modern texts I think that we also see um, the state you know the sort of nationalist impulses as well kind of coming into our thinking about why we're teaching what we're doing and and why we're studying what we're doing. Um, and, you know, and certainly customary practices. Um, I think that, you know, I had taught the English literature survey the exact same way that I had studied it. And it took a while before I started to think, why am I doing this? And the more I looked into why I was doing it, the more I thought maybe I should do this a different way. So, yes, I think that our traditional, um, you know, that the tradition is a very, a very strong influence on this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, just to come back um, after Athena's question and your response, she added another response. Uh, thank you. My background is on science and technology studies, not literature. So I was interested in the role of technology and reading as social technical practices. Um, so she's uh, just providing some context there. Um, mm -hmm. We have a question from uh, Caroline Rebordin. Um, and she says, not really a question, but I was reminded of Foucault's order of discourse as theoretical framework and his way of rethinking chronology during your presentation. Um, and she says, I also check the publication date of Gulliver's Travels, which has inspired many student projects in architecture during this past decade. So um, I should explain that Caroline is one of our um, colleagues from uh, architecture and design who's uh, joining us now. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I think that this is something that applies to other fields. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a specialist in other histories, so um, this is the area where I focus. But I would suspect that other types of history um, have similarly kind of gone through a, a bit of a renovation in how they're thinking about um, the progressive narratives that had been true in the past, or that not true that had been um, typical in the past, and so. Um, yeah, I think there is a sense of the past being more present. Um, there are certain areas where we've seen this more so than others, I think. So in, in my corner of the field, there's a lot of people who teach courses on things like um, Jane Austen in the modern world, you know, on um, film adaptations and so forth. And, and adaptation studies has become more more um prominence. But I, so I think that's one way that we've seen that kind of emerge a sort of um, anti-chronological discourse or dual chronological kind of study. Um, and so there's, there's other ways too, that we see um, sort of works, I guess, reifying through different time periods and that we study that we can see that as a contemporary work for multiple time periods at once. Thank you. Um, we have yet another question from Andy Popperwell, who says, thanks for a very interesting paper. It's a little outside my main research focus, but very useful nevertheless. Not a question, um, again, but I thought I'd mention that I've transcribed some of the library catalogue of Cropped Hall, uh, Cropped Hall, an 18th century mansion in Essex. It's dated around 1775. It's fascinating, and I'd be happy to share it with anyone who might find it useful. It does sound really interesting. It's in the excellent yeah. Essex Record Office. Well, that does sound very fascinating. Um, <laughs> I, was, I spent this summer... Um, with the British Academy Fellowship looking at examples of used books throughout um, the English Midlands. And it was um, really fascinating to, to look at um, how, not just what books existed in these libraries, but how they were acquired and who was acquiring them and what happened to them in some cases after the library was dissolved um, and how they got dispersed in those ways. So um, the used book market has often been studied mainly in its 20th century form of, you know, what books from earlier time periods are currently valuable. Um, but that changes over time and, and um, books that that were valuable in the past may not be valuable now and, and vice versa. So, um, you know, I've been looking a lot at, at library catalogs and um, how, how they got their books and, and what happened to them. Thank you. Yes. Um, I think, you know, once you start thinking about reception history, there's questions of, of yeah, yeah, who, who, who gets access to these older copies and in what formats and how widely do they circulate um, become really, really crucial. And, and, and often, yes, they're not circulating. They're sitting in a private library yeah. and um, maybe not getting read. Um, thank you so much. Um, I don't know if anyone has any final questions they'd like to ask or whether you'd like to turn on your microphone and speak your question direct. Oh, there's a new message. Um, I think there's one in the chat. Um, oh, yeah, I think it might be a message between Athena and... There's one from Harry Athena and Darbyshire. Andrew, actually, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, um, maybe I could close with one final question. Um, which is, I guess, a bit more practical and directed specifically at, um, yeah, the challenge of devising syllabuses that that kind of work for students. Um, al although we have someone, Julie, who is connecting to audio, possibly. I might save my question for another section. Hi, Julie, are you, are you about to speak? No, maybe not. Um, so... You, you mentioned that you'd been rethinking your approaches to the progressive syllabus, mm -hmm. uh, progressive literary historical syllabus. Um, what kind of what kind of strategies have you tried as alternatives and how have they worked? Yeah. Um, so this semester I am teaching a course on Jane Austen. And so one of the things I've incorporated in are, are works that Jane Austen had read <laughs> from the earlier 18th century. So to sort of take the single author course focus and really think about what that means from the Austin perspective. Um, so that's been that's been interesting because my students in that class have mostly not studied any earlier time periods except for perhaps Shakespeare. And so they don't have the chronology to hang these pieces in. So they're hanging them 
in a later time period. So we're reading a lot of works, um, you know, from the latter half of the 18th century, but they're sort of placing them all as contemporary to Austen, I think, in their minds, which is okay, honestly, because in, for Austen, they were contemporary to her. She, there are things that she mentions reading in her um, letters and other documents, um, you know, works that are referenced in her books or that are are mentioned. And so um, they they do exist contemporary with her, even if they were first published earlier. And I think the students understand that as much as as necessary for them to to get what's going on there. Um, so that's been an interesting experiment, I think. Um, and I think the students have found it helpful because they're, I mean, they're English majors, but they're not necessarily interested in the early English work. Um, and so they don't really care as much as we might that they don't have, you know, the chronological history to kind of put this into. I mean, it's okay if it exists a little bit in a vacuum. Um, I've also tried with a, you know, a century um, course, so an 18th century course, um, using different themes. And so having, you know, like a unit on, on love and marriage, a unit on crime literature, a unit on childhood. And that has also been really effective. And again, there is something lost in the sense that if I asked them to put the text in order, I think most of the students couldn't. And um, so, you know, that they don't learn that. Um, but I don't know that that's necessarily the most important thing they should be getting from that class, um, you know? And so I, I guess I've enabled, I've allowed myself to let go of that being the goal and to say, you know, they are getting a general sense of this stuff is existing <laughs> and in this earlier time period. And they have a general sense of the time period as being, you know, what century it's in. Um, and that that's okay, that's enough. They don't need to memorize as I had to um, publication dates and and learn which things were published in what order because that's not necessarily the um, the most effective way to study them. Yeah, thank you. I think yeah, I'm I'm edging that way myself. But it's it's nice to hear from someone who's taken the actual leap and and done those thematic clusters. Um, it's really really encouraging. Um, well, listen, thank you so much again for coming to, to speak to us. Um, I think I speak uh, for all the audience here in saying that it was a really fascinating talk and especially the the dimension of the, the book history and, and the images of the texts uh, as initially published or published and republished and re reprinted um, adds a lot to kind of this, this challenge to traditional literary history as progression. So um, yeah, thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. And I would welcome anybody who wants to um, stay in touch to email me. Um, my email is just my name at leah.or at louisiana.edu. So. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if Maria wants to come on screen now mm -hmm. and just mention uh, right. the next events uh, that Krell will be hosting. Yes, thank you, Catalina. I was thinking I was about to thank Leah on, on the chat, but this way I can do it in person. Thank you very much for your time. Everybody has enjoyed themselves a lot, including myself, coming from a philological background and thinking about the history of the literature and, of course, the history of the language that goes with it. So, But it's the, the new uh, insights are are very interesting to listen to. And thank you very much, Katerina, for, for doing such a great job hosting. Um, I only like to mention what we are um, planning, I mean, what we have um, uh, next week. Next week, we have another talk at a slightly different time. It's gonna be three to 4.30 uh, in person, face to face, because it's more of a worship, uh, workshopy kind of talk is about a different topic is is hosted by Anna Costantino and the topic is integrating inclusive practitioner research into culturally relevant language teaching and learning. So uh, everybody is welcome and invited. The site, uh, the room has been circulated and that is in a week uh, from now. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, hope everyone has a lovely evening and I'll look forward to